things we're trying desperately to hide to do is to start to end things on time. And that is counter family culture. So we're trying to change the um, uh, But when we have our meetings here, we're really trying to do that to respect the response and make sure that we get done on time. And um, uh, so our. our uh, <laughs> Yeah. This is uh, when you when you ask uh, ask someone to help you facilitate, they never know what they're going to get into, and uh, Kathy yes. Swords is going to be uh, working with us today to, to help facilitate. Um, my name is Elaine Brett, and I think I know most of you here, but it's, there's some new faces, and I'm so happy to see people from Kathy the community, from the schools, and from um, uh, from all over the community. These high conversations have been uh, a real interesting mix. Um, we started we started with a meeting back in December, and it was a, a general economic development. What's, how do we make this area thrive and survive? And we had some great people present their ideas and what they were doing, and it was very exciting. Um, uh, new businesses, um, old businesses, uh, things that are happening that, that really, really excited people. And, and it was great. And, and people left wanting more. And um, uh, Joanne Calgrees, who is the queen bee of the hive, mm -hmm. um, she's the manager of the hive here. Uh, Joanna and Kellen Ringo, who is from Bailey here, and I So we got to take this somewhere else. And um, we said there were a list of things at the end of that first meeting that people suggested that, would, that should be follow-ons. And so we're kind of crunching down the list. And, I believe it was either Bev or Cindy. Cindy that you know said, "What about education?" And we put it on the list. And so we have um, about a dozen topics we, we can fill. More than we'll go beyond the year with the topics that have come up. Um, the last one that we explored was uh, food and food distribution in particular uh, in um, the Northport County and Delta County. I know in Northport uh, Valley and, and Delta County. And out of that came um, at least three uh, groups who stepped up and are forming businesses around food distribution. And they got inspired, they saw that they had a support network, and they decided to go for it. And um, we're really excited about, about them. They're young people in the community, they're scared, <laughs> they know they're taking a risk, and um, they really want to do it. And so. Uh, they've got, um, they're in the planning stages and doing some very thorough work, and they're getting backup from members of the Hive who are experts in marketing and internet and business startups and, uh, and, and just all kinds of stuff. So um, that's the kind of thing that's happening here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Hive is a co-working space, and we have, uh, last time I heard, it was 75 members, it's probably over 80 now. Uh, people who are coming here to use the space uh, as their office, as their place of business. Um, we have a couple of companies, a couple of nonprofits, and a bunch of independent um, people uh, who are uh, developing their businesses or running their businesses out of here. And uh, it's been a very exciting process. We've just opened uh, this summer, and uh, already we're seeing you know, entrepreneurs just kind of pop up. And, and, and the, the exciting thing for me is we're seeing people, you know, 30-somethings, who are getting excited about their businesses and who are um, uh, getting support that they need from, from their peers and from others in the community. So uh, that's the hive. And I welcome you and welcome you to, to you know, take a walk around. We also double as an art gallery. Um, and uh, it's part of the art library in town and people can rent that art. Um, um, if, uh, if, uh, just a little housekeeping, if anyone needs a restroom, they're downstairs and uh, just take the stairway up front there and, and uh, help yourself. Um, anything else I need to... So I'm just, maybe talk a little bit about the evolution of this yeah, session. Yeah. So, um, when Cindy put her hand up and said, education and economy, okay, that's interesting, what do we do with that? And um, talked to a few people and it, it actually went out a, a directly about our schools and, and we thought about, yeah, how do, how do schools impact economy, how does the economy impact what's happening in our schools and that's an interesting exchange. Then as time went on, other things popped up like SEI doing 
an amazing program with military that are using instructors who are from here and the growth of SCI. And then um, uh, we thought, well, you know, we always hear that um, education is a prime thing at top of mind and people coming here looking for real estate. And so maybe we ought to consult with some of the people who are selling real estate and see what they're hearing from, from people. Um, and then, um, oh, I sat down with, with Bev and Cindy and they told me about the Flight of the Eagle project and how that impacts the community and what that's going to do for the community as a whole. And then we have people who are in search of alternative education and how that impacts the community. So it started to evolve into something bigger than just schools. And um, so we thought we'd broaden it out. And uh, so we've got um, kind of a panel tonight speaking to all of those different things. Um, what we're going to do is allow about 10 minutes for, for uh, folks to uh, share their thoughts on, on the impact, economy, and um, uh, and education, uh, and um, we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it in line on you know those two things in mind. Uh, we're not going to debate the best way to do it or the ideologies or what we like or what we don't like. But we're going to we're going to lay it out there, and then uh, we'll have time, um, <coughs> forty-five minutes to an hour um, before we get you out of here at eight o'clock uh, to to have some discussion around what this community does and what what's next. What do we what do we need next? Um, so, so that's 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 what we're going to run tonight. Um, actually, facilitating the meeting is Kathy Swartz from. Uh, she's the executive director at Solar Energy International, <coughs> and um, invite her to give me some relief. I, I I love doing this, but my face is always in front of stuff, and I and I, I need a break. Uh, one of the classes we're running at the Hive is how to run meetings, and hopefully it'll go into a, a, a facilitation class so that we can grow some more facilitators in the area to take on meetings and get people confident about that. Um, so uh, Kathy will be leading the meeting and uh, I'll let you do your introductions if you want. The only thing I'll say is we started a list up here and I invite, <laughs> thank you, I invite um, anyone who is involved with something, some educational project, whether it's for kids or whether it's for adults, um, if you want to put it up there, we'll, we'll try and give a like little 30 second blurb for people to say, um, you know, the Hive does workshops, go to our website, hivepanion.com, and we're doing business workshops and, um, uh, and career building workshops. Uh, but to do a little thing, on it, we'll do that after our, our, our speaker speak. And uh, we just thought it would be nice to have the opportunity to know who's aware of something going on. Because there's so much going on in the community that supplements the formal programs. And we'd like to you know, give a voice to that and, and create that list and we can put that out uh, so the people in the community and, and, the, and the, the county know that this stuff is going on. And they can, they're certainly welcome uh, to come to whatever's happening. So, um, any questions? Anything that you really want to see tonight, really want to hear that, that you can help to influence our speakers <laughs> to, to flavor their talk. <laughs> okay, we'll let them go then. Oh, I do want to mention, uh, Pat Frank is in the back there, and he's been video videoing um, <laughs> these, uh, mostly for his own educational practice. <laughs> uh, he's, he's learning the art of, of doing video, and um, it also, we've posted these up on the Hive's um, website so that if people can't come, uh, they can they can uh, watch the videos. Um, uh, and it really works. Uh, the first one we did was you know like a two-hour video, and uh, two days later I got a, a message from uh, our county administrator, Robbie the Valley, that she watched the whole thing. And great, we'll be here, but thank you, you know, for spending the time to just to hear what the people in the community are saying. And um, and so I just want to make you aware that, that Pat is, is doing that. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. And tell us, she wanted to do a little promo about the chamber. Exactly. So um, this workshop, well, first of all, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, this session tonight is sponsored by the Hive and the Paonia Chamber of Commerce. And um, I myself am, am, am a chamber board member. And we also have John in the room, who's a chamber board member, as well as Kit. And we have our fabulous bookkeeper, Susan, here. Oh, thank you, Susan. 
Jackson. Um, so if you have any questions about the Peony Chamber, we're a very enthused, very get, her, get it done type of board. And uh, so if you have any questions about what the Chamber is doing, please don't hesitate to let us know. Oh, sorry, Doris. <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's Doris is also a board member. Thank you. Um, and we all, in the back of the room, if you have a business or if you're an individual who wants to support the Peony Chamber of Commerce, we have our membership letters. So, or our membership form, so please, I encourage you to become a member of the Chamber. It's very inexpensive, and the things that we can do to help bring businesses here and just bring more people to the community, so your membership really counts. Also, we are in the process of hiring, and this is going to be a new release for everyone, we're going to be hiring a part-time employee for the Paleo Chamber. So if you know of anyone who's interested in this, please come see me or any of the board members. Um, and we can distribute the job description to you. So on that note, we're going to get started with the first of our five panelists. Um, each of our panelists has 10 minutes, and Elaine is going to be our very diligent timekeeper, so we have plenty of time for questions at the end. And so our first panelist tonight is Karen Gibson. She is the superintendent of our fabulous Bell <coughs> County Schools, and we're pleased that you come over tonight and join us in the panel. Options. 
and kids wanting additional options. So we are looking at ways of how to add more options for students because our goal is to have our students, our graduates, graduate with options, whether they want to go to college, no matter what that college is, we want to give them the skills to go on, whether they want to go in the world of work right away or if they want to go to military. We're really looking at adding more career and tech classes to provide opportunities for those kids. Um, so we're real excited about that. Also, I just wanted to mention that Peonia High School had a graduation rate of 94.4%, which is pretty high. The state is only at 77.3%, so we are much higher. And as a district, the district average was 81.6. Again, Peonia High School, 94.4. Yes, congratulations to staff.
four communities, and then we have Crawford community as well. They're all rural schools when you look at them. But they thought the strength of that was the ability to be flexible and responsive. And that is a huge advantage to our schools being small. Our community members want the schools to provide quality environments and opportunities to address each student's needs. And that's another strength of our schools. We're able to address student needs. And um, two minutes? I don't know, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I can fill your whole evening. <laughs> but, um, some of the things we looked at as external pressures, we are battling kind of our student population is declining and we're paid per pupil. So you hate to say it, but each student kind of has that dollar sign. So when we lose a student, that cuts our funding. So we really, um, that's why this is good and we welcome all students in. Um, so just retention of quality teachers and being able to, um, you know, pay them. And so this is all put on our website, this whole report. But here in the Kayoni community, I felt a lot of support for our schools, for our teachers, and just making sure that our graduates, when they graduate, they're able to fulfill their dreams. No matter what that is or where that is, we give them what they need to be successful. I think that's exciting. <laughs> Sports, 
but our community, it's for the community. It's going to be open to the community during after school hours, and um, the, the trail facilities will be open to the community. The track will be open to the community for after school. It's just really exciting. This, this place, the track, and um, the facilities will pro provide a safe place for the community to be to exercise. We'll be able to host sporting events so that we get dollars coming in, right? People coming to our local restaurants, perusing the town, maybe stopping in at, at the little shops. Um, it, it enhances our, it, like I said, it enhances our school property for people to come in when they come into town. Um, this also will allow our students to be more competitive. They are successful with what we have currently, but with more and better facilities, they'll even be more successful sports-wise. Um, during when BMW comes through, and sometimes when Ride the Rockies comes through, they, they stay at our, um, they stay up at the campus. Well, they'll continue to be able to do that at a, a safer place. We'll have, when this project is completed in years, they'll have outdoor bathrooms, maybe even some camp spots down by the river. Um, we're excited about the trail system and that it'll, it'll provide safe access to the river. And that, I just know myself when I visit communities across the state, what I love to do is to take my bike and walk along their trails. And when I walked along, what we have down there, you should take a look. It's open for you to go do that. It's beautiful down there. It's gorgeous. Um, and what else I'm excited about is when you put this facility up at our high school, it brings the community together. It um, allows us all to have a place that's kind of common, and it draws us together, and it builds community. It's it's aesthetically pleasing, and I think, quite honestly, it will benefit the economy for sure. So, let's talk about our film, and then one more thing afterwards. This is the Peonia High School Flight of the Eagle Project, Phase One: The Track and Field. We don't really have a track facility. We have a dirt track. It's not a full track, so you can't get accurate practice on it, really. The master plan for the project is fantastic. We get a new football field, a new track, we have new walking paths, and we have opportunities for outdoor education, and all of it for the whole community is here on campus. When the school came in, one of the hopes of this high school was that we would have better facilities. So now, 30 years later, to still not have a track is heartbreaking. In order to start phase one of our master plan, we need to raise $100,000. <laughs> this isn't just for the students. It gives the whole community a safe place to come and exercise. You know, I try and walk a lot, but it's really hard on some of these
high school in 2003, I went on to the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I majored in aerospace engineering. One of the things that I also learned along the way, though, about being an astronaut, is that you have to be really strong and really healthy. Throughout high school, playing sports really helped, so that when I do apply to the astronaut corps, uh, it'll give me the best chances of actually being selected as an astronaut. In phase one, we're going to need a good foundation, which means we have to move some dirt. You can make this dream possible by donating to the Flight of the Eagle Project today. The Flight of the Eagle Project, once it's complete, will really bring uh, a new life into Paonia. There's no amount too small. We've got to get everyone behind this project because everyone's going to benefit from it. Donating to this cause would be beneficial to everybody in the community. For our school and for our community, help the Flight of the Eagle Project reach our goal.
in very nicely is Doris Danielson. She is a realtor with Remax, and she's going to give a very unique perspective about the people who are moving to this valley and what they're looking for, especially relating to education. Yeah, that was so fun to watch. I, uh, I recognize so many of those kids. And Lindsay Merrick is big, that my kids when they were little. And then um, also just, you know, the fact that these kids are running track on dirt tracks. And my kids are in track, and they had to run, um, my daughter did hurdles, on the residential streets with practice hurdles and stuff like that. And it's amazing what they've achieved with what little we have. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of background in into my experience with education around here and in general, and then how that ties into what I do now as a real estate agent. Um, some people know this, but back in my other life, when I lived in Tucson, I was an elementary school teacher, and I taught fourth grade in a self-contained classroom in a traditional public school. And uh, when we moved here, my kids started in the elementary school but I, my son was having, he had some developmental delays, and he was he had a little bit of dyslexia. And he, I noticed that he was really struggling with his self-esteem. So I went ahead and pulled them and homeschooled them. Well, that wasn't a great idea for my family. Uh, my kids did not like being homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> so, during that time, uh, a group of parents, Amy being one of them with me, um, ten of a, ten moms got together and, and formed the steering committee that created the Montessori school. And luckily for us, the district was very visionary and was willing to take the Montessori school in under the umbrella of a, as a public school, uh, as well as the vision school. At the same time, they were both being formed concurrently. So my kids thrived through Montessori. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough about it. And then as they aged out of that, they transitioned into the middle school and to the high school. And once again, they thrived. So, you know, I have a lot of experience with how well kids can do in this diversity of opportunity that we have here. Um, both my kids ended up becoming very high achieving. My, my son was one of the valedictorians a few years ago. Um, they've both since graduated from college. My son actually just graduated in December. And he was able to graduate early because he was able to take some college credit courses. So he graduated in three and a half years. And they both did very well in college. The kids come out of our schools really well prepared. And um, so I can't speak highly enough about that. Um, what I wanted to bring up was that realtors are often the first point of contact for people that are coming from out of area and when they don't know a community. And if they have kids, one of the first questions they ask is, um, how are the schools? What are the schools like here? And they want to know what the opportunities are. And I'm always really excited to tell them because we have such a diversity of schools. I mean, look at what a small area we are and how many different types of opportunities we have. It's, it's amazing. Um, so I'm able to kind of talk them through, through what their opportunities are. Uh, I wanted to pass out some of our graphs. Well, these are some pie charts that we have. But we make, we track where our buyers come from. And if you can, if, you may have to share with a neighbor. I have 50 here. So maybe if you take one and pass it to every other person or something. Oh, I think I should keep one of those. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> approximately of our buyers come from out of area, um, whether that be out of this little North Fork Valley or out of, out, of the, um, out of the entire county. So, so that's, you know, like three quarters of our buyers are coming here not knowing anything about this area, other than that they may have come through and they liked it. But, um, so, so we end up kind of filling in the gaps for them in terms of what's going on in this area, and school is an important part of that. Uh, so anyway, you can see that here's an interesting thing to note. 19% um, 
percent of our buyers come from out of state. That's up from last year. Last year it was about 11 percent. So 8 percent more buyers coming from out of state, which I think is interesting, um, just that they're finding our little area. If you look on the second page, you see where the buyers are buying. And it, I, it's not a surprise that most of our buyers that come to our office here in Canada are buying in Canada or the North Fork. Um, but <laughs> but um, it is, you know, you know, we do most of our business around here, but also throughout the whole county. Uh, but I think that I think that our role is that we are able to to just inform people about what we have here and what we have here is excellent. And I know that um, sometimes people feel like they want more options and, and more is great too. But I think that what we have is, is really good. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about who our buyers are because I think there was a time when a lot of our buyers were families with children. And it seems like it's transitioning. And we, we feel like we're seeing more buyers that are um, mailbox income retirees or people that are able to work uh, from a distance. So people that, people that come to the hive and they're able to work, you know. Sure. Is it time? <laughs>
Um, yeah. Even if they're not, like, they're, maybe they're looking for adult education opportunities. Oh, you know, actually, no, I haven't. Um, I mean, I think when they're talking about things like maybe classes at the creamery and stuff, you know, I've, they've asked about that and I've been able to tell them, yeah, there are all kinds of opportunities or at the Blue Sage for, for really, you know, fun kind of extracurricular stuff, but not, not specifically for um, any other kind of education. And we've seen our, we do this yeah. armchair travel in the windows at the library, and we've seen that grow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting to learn things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doris. Okay. All right, so our next speaker, so our first speaker tonight is Cassandra Shank. And Cassandra, for the last eight years, she has been focusing on the intersection of youth education and the economy. She actually began the Teens on Farm program. And uh, she, her passion is community development and education. So, Sandra. I would 
to show you a picture I took today of a, of a classroom that is very different. It's an, it would look very old-fashioned to most of the families here. But to my family and, and other families, it, it represents a unique, distinct choice that is not available. It's not at the Montessori school. It's not, a, it's not effectively helping our kids at the, at the vision school. And, and so our family, my family, has had a difficult choice to make for eight years. And that choice has been, can I go to work? Do I stay home? Do I school the kids? How do we put food on the table if I homeschool the kids? Should we send them to a school that in our hearts we don't feel is, is where they belong? And that's been a hard choice to make. And so I, I wasn't sh sure how to say this, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, again, going back to this thesis, this small school that we want to bring here is going to be good for this community. And there's direct reasons why. It's going to help kids and help my kids. It's going to help a number of kids that don't have a school right now. Uh, according to our intent to enrolls, there were 19 kids that want to be part of our district schools that aren't here, that aren't in our district schools. Uh, so it's going to have a direct positive benefit to, to a number of kids that are, that are here, perhaps like mine, in district schools, but I have concerns about what they're getting. And I'm just, I'm just going to say this flat out. Okay, so one of the distinctions and unique aspects of this education is that we do, that I do not believe in using a lot of electronics with kids. And I know that sounds old fashioned, but there again, for elementary level kids, I would prefer that my children were taught directly by teachers who have a lot of creativity and, and that they can use their hands and they can get that relationship with the teacher. And that's my personal opinion, but I'm very passionate about it because I want my kids to have the best chance in life. And so that choice, you can see, is not here. Even though we have great schools, we have no place to send our kids unless we homeschool them. That honors that media-free desire that we have. So that's just one example proving why we need another school. If we were to get this school, I did a quick survey. I got six families to respond. Out of those six families, uh, they represented, no, I have to look at my notes. I believe it was 12 businesses. And many families are multi working multiple, multiple businesses. Um, no, sorry, it was eight businesses. And uh, all together, if you looked at their gross uh, product or their gross sales and services from the past year, it was $480,000. And I got some comments from those families. And some of the comments are, I currently only work in the summer so I can homeschool in the winter. I would love to be able to send my son to school so I could take on more work. I used to make another $15,000 a year because I could paint houses. Um, here's an exciting Here's an exciting comment. I am, with my brother, moving a chandelier manufacturing business from San Francisco to here. These are local boys, they're brothers. They were alternatively schooled here. They're moving this chandelier manufacturing um, business to Paonia and planning to hire seven people next year. Last year, they grossed over $100,000. They're hoping that that really expands. Another father is, currently has his own business. And he has two employees. Um, he he grows two hundred thousand last year, hoping to grow five hundred next year. If you've ever had um, maybe these hard cider, that that grows a lot. So these are families that are here because they want longer education. And I and this hive is here because of a family that moved here hoping to get longer education. So all together, the economic benefits of these families that I that just responded to my interview, I asked them, were they self-employed? Did they have employees? My husband has a full-time employee. He's a young man, just got married, probably will have kids, probably will send them to the traditional schools. He is because we're here that this job is here. 19 employees all together, including the self-employed people. So 19 people are employed in just this Six group of families that I interviewed, and 
and this was just today, so there's more. And so we really believe in the potential economic draw into our valley. Could we partner in other ways with other schools and keep them strung together? I think so. I saw a newspaper article. This is really interesting. It's from New Mexico. I picked it up. It's on the economy and how to make a strong economy in a rural place like this. And there was one quote here that said, when we all do better, we all do better. And we really believe that. So we've got some great ideas on how to work together with our schools. We'd like to help each other. And I'm excited about the potential. So thank you very much. Schools Coordinator for um, Solar Energy International, and she's going to talk about some of the unique things that we're doing. Well, no, as the I is, it, it, it is one of the um, longest running energy education and training, skill training organizations in the world. Uh, it was founded in 1991, and it's running strong today. So, And Solar in the Schools is a, an outreach program of SEI. Um, we also have a Native American training program uh, going out to tribal communities, and not just in Colorado, but all over the nation. And um, there's also a scholarship program at SCI. It's an outreach program. Um, so tonight, I will be talking about a, a high school opportunity recently. Um, but also, I wanted to let you know what Solar New School is and what we've been doing here in the community, for those of you who don't know. Um, so I've been the coordinator for that program since 2010. Uh, started out sort of a small program. SIS is internally funded by SEI. Uh, like we said, it's a small outreach program. You know, it's not their huge um, you know, training. So um, it's a small program, so we started out small. And um, what really SIS is devoted to, and I say SIS for solar schools, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> 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 It's, to, it's devoted to uh, teaching the importance of energy, really. That, that's really the bottom line. And it is such an important topic in our world. It basically runs our world, really. And I think energy literacy in the schools um, is, is really important. And you know, our teachers, our schools are doing so much, uh, especially here with probably, you know, as much as they can with little resources. So, sis, um, what we're doing is we're providing um, presentations and hands-on activities to schools to basically teach about um, where energy is sourced locally, how we're using our energy, and then third is really about renewables. Um, and even before renewables, we teach about energy conservation and efficiency. We really want to hit those uh, three things first before we hit, um, you know, solar or wind, etc. Because without energy conservation and efficiency, it's really, you know, not a good idea to go to renewables. So, um, the program in the last three, um, three years or so is really targeted towards fifth grade elementary education. Um, I either directly contact teachers to um, give presentations or teachers will contact me. Um, and we have targeted fifth grade because in, in the Colorado standards, and in Delta County's curriculum, energy, well, energy really kicks in in the fourth grade level, but then in fifth grade, they, um, they hit the um, renewable energy, or renewable and non-renewable resources piece of the curriculum. And then in sixth grade, they actually, um, for state standards, they're looking at um, the disadvantages and advantages of both fossil fuels and alternative energy. Those are sort of the state standards. Now, Delta County, I know, sort of is different by different schools and teachers and what units they'll teach. So that piece kind of gets weaved in there with different teachers. Um, but moving forward, um, this is program. So we've targeted fifth graders, but we certainly have done presentations, both um, in school and then we also go to a lot of events. Um, and we work partner with different organizations like Western Salt Conservation Center, River Days. We'll do uh, their events and do a little solar fair. This year, the entire fourth grade in Delta County will be there. Um, we work with the library, library, Delta County Library, and we'll do summer programs for them. Um, 
What else? We also, we, we go a little bit out of Delta County, I'll just mention that. We, we've gone to Mesa County. They have a four-day outdoor wilderness lab that we, we've done a day for. Um, this will be our second year up there doing renewable energy education for them. Um, what else? Cedar Ridge does middle school, does a science night. So we, we kind of do events and in school programs. Um, so that's where we've been. And moving forward, our, our goal with SIS is to outreach to every elementary, middle, and high school in Delta County. And promote, we, we really would like to promote sort of a continuum of energy education through the grades. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been getting there. Um, you know, we've gone from elementary. This past year we've been in partnership with something called TEN. Sam will tell this is a new program that's um, all these kids, all these teachers here know about it. It's teaching environments naturally, and that is led by the Colorado State Park and Wildlife. And SCI myself has been involved with developing that core program for Delta County. And so last year we had all the entire eighth grade Delta County eighth graders come to SCI's lab over a four-day period and do uh, lab stations with us, and, and it, it was great, really good. And without TEN, TEN provided a really great organization. Um, there's a woman who is a retired teacher, but very busy still yes. with TEN, Anita Evans, who provided all the groundwork to organize and get all the schools and, you know, the teachers. That is a real, <laughs> that's a real piece of work, for sure. <laughs> Organizing teachers to do something. <laughs>
um, energy. And we have a, a world-class lab <laughs> right here in our yard. So it's, it's pretty amazing what, you know, that we can, we can attract folks for that reason. But then also on the other end is we can have students who are, who are learning here and then going out, hopefully either, you know, in that industry or maybe bringing an energy, the alternative energy industry here as a small business. Um, you know, I know Kathy's talked about the Chaco building. I'm not sure exactly where that stands, but you know, if we get people who students who are interested in this in this line of work, who knows where that could go? They could start they could start a business right here in this town and start doing um, solar installs, etc. Um, the one uh, one other thing, and now <laughs> stop is um, we also we're connected with what we're called. In SDI, we have another sort of program called Delta Solarization, and that's to try and get solar, more solar in the community. I'm talking solar on buildings. And so connecting the school or the education with that in the community would be a really great um, opportunity. So, okay. Practical skills, music, and 
Arts, the Learning Council Thank you. I had no idea. <laughs> yes. Um, Monty Slater, I'm with the Kids Pasture Project, and we've been around six years almost, and we're really uh, vamping up for 2015. We'll have a uh, spring season beginning April 23rd, and we're going to begin the park, and we support community organizations, and we, um, the kids basically make a homemade pasta dinner and serve it to the community organization. We celebrate the organization. The kids get to learn about the community. They get to learn about practical skills, restaurant, you know, they wait tables that some of you already know about Kids Pasta Project. But I just really want to emphasize that the main purpose of the organization is for kids to really learn through serving the community. That's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
there've been there've been residents coming in to to focus time on their art, um, and they love to intervene and, and, and insert themselves into the community. Um, and Catherine's doing a project on um, uh, schools <laughs> and education right now. And uh, so you're, you're from San Francisco, right? Yeah. Tell us about your project a little. Sure. <laughs> um, so I've been at Elsewhere in February um, working on a project. It's a sister project to a feature length documentary that I've been working on for three years. We're following five teachers going through an alternative teacher training program in San Francisco. And my project partner and I sort of looked at each other last winter and said, There's no way we're going to fit everything we want into one film. Um, filmmaker's Dilemma. So we decided to come up with a second project that's going to live online and we're calling it The Who Question. There's a lot to talk about schools, what do we need to teach, um, how should things be taught, what is the school day going to look like, all those things, but this project specifically looks at who do we need as teachers. So they're all short videos and I just started to film in January in Denver. And so my time here in Peonia was um, me editing together some of the first short videos and starting to post them online. So if you, if you want to chat, uh, I'll be around. And then also in about a month, thewhoquestion.com will, it'll be live even as it's growing. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Sure. So y'all, we have about 30 minutes for questions. Oh, did, did I miss? Sorry. Go ahead. And then we'll go on to question and answer. Um, uh, in the adult realm, and specifically in the agriculture realm, um, Valley Organic Growers Association has a craft program, which is um, a <coughs> it's a program for young farmers. For them, who are the farmers who are coming to the valley this year as interns or apprentices, can learn from experienced farmers and go on their farms and have an evening of educational lectures. That happens beginning in May and goes throughout the season. We also have another opportunity that's been funded through a local Colorado farm development initiative for farmers who are interested in pursuing um, biodynamic agriculture on their farms to become certified and be able to market their products as biodynamic. And that program is going to kick off in April and follow through the system uh, through the season until probably November, maybe even January. Um, and the economic uh, benefit to that is directly in the farmer's pocket, in the bottom line, that they're able to show as a profit because currently we're seeing a very um, high increase in, in knowledge and awareness of biodynamic agriculture, and those products are highly valuable in the marketplace. So that's happening. And the people would learn more at... They'll, learn, they'll eventually learn more through VOGA. Okay. I'll put it through um, VOGA. So, VOGACO.org. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all. So we have about half an hour. If you have questions for the panelists, have questions for each other, there's a lot of knowledge in this room. And remember, keep it in the context of education and economic development. <coughs> and as this community goes through changes, you know, these two things play very closely together, the economy and economic or education and economic development. So at this point, questions. Is there anything you can have? Oh, you have questions. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
But Randall's idea is, again, part of a greater conversation that we're having at the district level. We feel like we're pretty good at the school at preparing students for college, but what about those students that are not necessarily interested in a four-year degree or a two-year degree? And so we have an incredible community here who wants to be involved with our kids, and the opportunity to look at their upper grade level years and saying, you can get some valid work experience, maybe you're getting paid, maybe you're not. There's work study and there's the internship piece. You can be earning school credit for that while getting valuable experience that's educating you on whether that's really the right path that you want to follow. Mm -hmm. I had a great story about a young lady who wanted to be a nurse and then fainted at the side of blood when she actually got <laughs> involved in a program at college that she was paying to do. Um, or a lineman that they said, okay, go you know, climb the telephone pole and he said, well, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> Maybe you should have figured that out a little earlier. And so this, you know, we're trying to capitalize on these assets in the community. A lot of the kind of things that we're talking about here. And we're really hoping that it will launch as early as next school year. So is there a name for that, Lindsay, the, this program? Um, high School Internship Program, HSIP. <laughs> I'll say that God, that no. used to be in, in place at Paline High School. Oh. Years ago, since what did you say? We're so behind our heads. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
than what's out there because mm -hmm. you know in a city you can see oh wow there's those jobs and that job here what are they seeing yeah. Yeah. so the more we can like have it out there in whatever fashion we do you know if it's really putting the word out there through the schools or through the community and and getting kids and or young people connected to that then I think the more um, we'll have kids either staying here and building economic, you know, an economic benefit here locally or going out and doing great things mm -hmm. elsewhere. But mm -hmm. it's hard here to see what's what's there for, for most students, really. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. I just, would you, could you identify, you know, just give your name, um, I had requested that, I forgot to ask yeah. you that, <laughs> just so uh, we know who's talking. Helen Dennison. <laughs> And uh, I, just going back to what Doris said when she was talking about her children and their experience in school, I was kind of relieved to hear that they went, they integrated into schools and they found their path that way. Um, I, I taught for many years through the vision program and I found that some of my uh, homeschool students were just not finding that connection like Lindsay mm -hmm. just spoke about. And I, been, you know, kind of brainstorming how do how do we provide that in our school system? You know, reach out to kids who don't have just just don't know it's there. <laughs> just don't have that connection because what I've seen over the years, um, and I started teaching in 1966, <laughs> so what I've seen over the years um, is that if, if, if you miss those ages. Uh, this is why it's great that the school is doing this now, because if you miss those ages and the 18-year-old becomes a 21-year-old and still hasn't found that niche, they begin to, um, you know, go back home and live with mom and dad. We know that's a big demographic. <laughs> that is a big demographic. <laughs> and, and I just don't want kids to miss that opportunity. So I'm really happy to hear all of this, and I'm thinking, let's keep our thinking caps on and see if we can't offer enough in school to get that successful um, integration that Doris described. Are there ways within, like existing ways within the school district, like, you know, we just heard just a small snippet of all these incredible classes, like, how how do students learn about this? Because mm -hmm. obviously you're not doing flaggers anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. How are there the opportunities for students? Yeah. I think there's many opportunities. And um, having internships or, or work study students really isn't anything new to the school district. Um, 25 years ago when I taught at Fruit Alignment, I was over programs where I had the best job in the world. I would and supervise kids on their jobs and talk to mm -hmm. employers. But it's nice to reinvent it and get people excited about it, so it's a good job. But there are opportunities, and something that's going on, it's 2021. So the graduates in 2021, which sounds like a long ways off, we have some meetings going on right now. The graduation guidelines are changing. Graduates have to be prepared before they complete school. So it's kind of like there's three pathways. You know, the career and tech pathways and the solar piece fits perfectly. Students will graduate with a certificate and a diploma or a drafting or so they have to graduate with a career and tech certificate or um, along with their diploma. Or they're on the pathway of going to college and they have to have a certain assessment score so they're qualified. Or they're on a military track. But students, there's bridges that are on-ramps and off-ramps can change between. But so we're planning for 2021, and it's so exciting, the opportunities for our graduates. And, you know, it's kind of, we've always kind of had those things, but just really thinking how we prepare our graduates. Because that's what it's about. We want our people to go out and be happy and successful. You know, mm -hmm. success means something different to everyone. But just give them the tools so they can do what they want to do. Those are today's seventh graders, aren't they? They are. Yeah. 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 So yeah. they're starting. Yeah. They're starting. Yeah. 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 So you have to have these graduation guidelines by the time they are freshmen. You have to have them in place. Like in the future. No. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're going to do John and two graduates. I'm John Schultz. Uh, I'm with the Bayonne Chamber. And uh, 
newly formed economic development committee. Anyway, part of part of my background includes uh, understandings of things about major trends that are going on. In case you haven't noticed, there are a lot of changes in our society right now. There are many things starting to evolve that haven't really been part of what's going on in the past. A lot of uh, new businesses that will be coming into existence are tapping into the wisdom of nature on how to do things. And that's part of my expertise. And if, if students could be exposed to some of the breadth of that, for example, maybe a, a business doesn't have one major product. It's designed as a whole system that generates no waste, no toxins, has 15 cash flows, and you need people that have the training to jump into each of the pieces. So there's more opportunities, there's more jobs, there's more income. And that's, uh, there, I work with an organization called Zuri, Zero Mission Research Initiative, 14,000 projects in 50 or 60 countries. Some of them are in the United States, but it's a hard sell here because we're so used to doing it the other way. But the opportunities are massive for that kind of thing. And so I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. how you might get some of that into the, right. into the school. Thanks. Thanks, John. Susan. I like what my I'm Susan. Um, I like hearing what you said after um, hearing the um, this career certificate college military. Um, I really appreciate there's a broad spectrum of both educators and people with ideas in the room that's exciting to be here. Um, one of the things that I feel like I would like to speak to is that. Educating people, children, and getting them a job, I don't see a linear mapping between those two points. I really see that our job as parents, as a community, and as educators is to provide a very broad platform of how to learn. How children learn is all different. I learn so much differently than everyone else in this room. My children learn differently than all the students in their classrooms. There are ways to teach to the majority of students, but there are people that fall outside of those guidelines, and they're not stupid. They learn differently. Mm -hmm. And diversity in our education, like the um, small school Cassandra's talking about. My kids went to Montessori, and um, I have nothing but um, just gratitude and nothing but all the things to say about that experience and the diversity of having um, many types of education so that many different people can have their brains stimulated not so they can get a job but so that they can find their livelihood which may include having a job and being a part of some larger company or organization or um, Having a skill set, working with your hands, is such an important piece even as you become smarter and smarter and smarter. Continuing to work with your hands creates um, a continued uh, presence in how you learn. So I just wanted to throw out there that school and education and jobs and economy, it's I don't see that as the linear mapping. I see that providing people with an experience of all the solar, the arts, the athletics, whatever it is they're into, supporting how they learn, all these different ways is more important to our economy, not because um, they're going to go out and get a job and they're going to support a family here, but because what if they travel the world and they never come back here? What if they, um, what if they don't make a lot of money but they are um, support uh, new ways of thinking in their community that create um, a more dynamic community as we move forward? I, um, I, so I just wanted to say I really appreciate and I'm very delighted by the community that we have and 
the um, incredible opportunities for our kids and the love uh, and support of this community that I, I just want to say in light of this large, this, the group gathered and the things that are said, I, I, I uh, yeah, again, it's not, A plus B is not always equal C. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You remind me of a, um, a guy I worked with, a, a chemist, and when I was going to go to um, get my master's, um, he said something that always stuck with me. He said, it's not, it's not about what you get out of the books, but if you come out of uh, the graduate education and you learn how to think, yes. you will have succeeded. Yes. And, um, yes. and, I, and I, I'm just reflecting on that. Well said. Well said. Well said. Well said. Well said. Thank you. I, uh, a couple things. One, I'd like to explore ways to include kids a whole lot more in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that relates to the next thing is like I find that when kids are more empowered and have more of a sense of adventure, that, that, you know, we can have all the great opportunities in the world in the valley, but unless the kids really see mm -hmm. it, and are part of the conversation about creating it and making it happen, especially the older kids. You know, like I think this value for the younger kids would be really yes. right. The older kids. But I can't tell you how many kids I know who yeah. love the belt. Like really great kids. Who and, you know, they love the high school at the high school level. Yeah. And high school level. And um and my daughter's even gone this semester just for a semester just because, you know, that there are other opportunities out there. And I think we have to embrace that. And I think so if kid if two things, we can bring outside people to the valley, like when I heard you talking about SCI, I was like, what an opportunity for, I mean, you're probably already doing it, but you know, for high school kids to come to the valley, mm -hmm. so that our high school kids feel really good about the activities that they have, because they don't realize it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then and teachers, you know, to come to the valley for SCI, <coughs> whatever, but you know, the whole idea of making this a destination, bringing people to the valley, so that we can, um, you know, we're talking about economics here, mm -hmm. so that piece, and then, um, as I mentioned, like when my daughter was looking at different options, I thought, wouldn't it be great if kids could just go to semester abroad without going overseas? Mm -hmm. Hey, just go to another town in Colorado, and you know, and come back, and and bring that back into the community, and bring it, you know, so that you can find community. Exchange. Yeah. 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 That's a good Local idea. Local exchange. Bring other people here too, and then they're exposed, and then they're more a part of it somehow. Mm -hmm. So to me, the way that economy and education do go hand in hand is the scarcity of resources equals money <laughs> has a huge effect on what's available to our kids, especially at the upper levels of education, like in the high school. They're doing some amazing, wonderful things in the high school. Mr. Jensen's having them make theremins in engineering. I mean, some really awesome things. <laughs> but they don't have the resources to do very much of that stuff. And that's really what I was hoping we could talk about um, because I feel like the splintering, because we all have strong ideas about what we want for our kids, we're splintering off into all of these small groups and none of them have enough resources to do the job they want to do. And so I was hoping that would be part of our conversation. I really feel I really feel the need in seeing so many kids leave in the last two years. Like I wish I had written the list, but it is phenomenal how many kids are leaving this valley. And it's not because the high schools can't do a good job. It's because they don't have the money to do a good job. If you can't offer a shop class in high school, if you can't offer, you know, they do what they can, but they just don't have the resources to offer very much, you start thinking, why am I, why am I still living here? My kids are in high school. I should probably move somewhere else so that they could have shop class or home ec or a really good arts program. So I wanted to talk about that, the splintering into the alternative groups and I totally understand I was in the pilot group. I was, I was on the founding committee of the Montessori School, so I've done it. I totally know what that's about, and you want the best for your kids. But I hope we can come up with solutions that all of us could work together, if we could all work together and bring all of these things into the same pool, we would have so much more. So I wonder if there are ways to do that. 
to, to work with, with you guys or to work with Cade or, or whatever. Right, right. Um, sometimes it's finding time in the kids' schedules, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But we're, we're certainly open. And, uh, just contact us. All right, yes. Thanks for being patient. That's fine. So I, I do have to leave, I apologize, but I would like to propose that we keep this conversation going because um, as you pointed out, I'm really interested in seeing kids make a meaningful impact in our economy because that's a win-win. It's a win-win for our businesses and our farms, and it's a win for the kids. We all know that. I really would argue <laughs> that a kid needs to be you know, steered into one direction. If he's hands-on, I agree with what Susan said, that the hands-on learning benefits the mind. And so if they go on to a career like I did, my farm experience really helped me. And that hands-on experience is important. And we have a lot of opportunities that don't necessarily take money. I think if we kept talking and kept creative, we could really ben we could benefit our kids and make our schools a distinct place to be. And one last thing I wanted to say is we um, we would like, on behalf of the Walder Initiative, we are planning to go through 12th grade. We would like to have a conversation about how to work together in this community so that perhaps we could send our kids to the, to the sports program, we could take on the arts programs like a drama, you know, just options like that that are win-win for everybody that actually enhance the learning for this whole community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did Karen mention, someone mentioned they want to see more of the kids' input. Um, did you mention that a bunch of the kids went yesterday to the district mm -hmm. to talk about this? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. to get their input. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm a police officer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was very productive. What I noticed and I love about kids, they just say it. And
and there just isn't another body in the room to do it. And, you know, as you move forward, because I'm leaving. <laughs> Not because of the quality of the school. <laughs> if there's a beach with my name on it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I, I look at this piece here as an incredible opportunity for somebody that says, I could donate two hours of my week, a week, to coordinate. Coordinating, that is it. Facilitating the conversations between the school and the student and the person that wants to help them out. And make a schedule. You talked about you've seen people in your career who were hired and employed to supervise those programs. Right. I know they had one in my high school growing up. Yeah. And now we, we certainly yeah. couldn't. We couldn't. We could never do that. But um, that's just my last little thoughts there. Yeah, it's, it, it's not for a No, I think it could be funded right. outside of the school. Obviously, the schools <laughs> that would be cannot fund yeah. it. Yeah. 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 But and it's, you know, you, you might have the idea, or you might have the idea of a program, but you don't probably have the time either to do the organization. But somebody can help me. One, one thing that I'm experiencing, especially with the food programs we're doing, um, and may I'm totally wrong on this, but it, it always seemed that it needed an advocate on the inside. True. And not necessarily to, you know, do the heavy lifting, but somebody to, to stand up at the teacher's meeting and say, yeah, this is a cool program. And I know what you mean, Elaine, because I, I watched that go, you know, and I felt like, you know, I tried to be the advocate, and I, it got down to the lower end of my list of my things to do, you know, and I think you have teachers that want to be advocates, and Ellie wants to build, you know, she wants to make a movie with students for the film project. Probably not going to happen this year. But if, uh, if, 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 if somebody in here who's worked with kids, or somebody in the community who's worked with kids, could come and be the advocate, that they're consistently involved. They are technically a volunteer, maybe even from the school. Um, that they they get to know the staff and their interests and their strengths, and they get to know the kids and their their passions and those pieces. And then they are kind of like a student counselor. <laughs> of some sort that then says, you know, I know Adriana has an interest in, in public media, so he should go and do this piece at KDMF. Mm -hmm. And that is technically my job to do, but again. And we did. For, like, <laughs> right. But, but no, I guess I'm saying that you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. An advocate. So who? So even if so, a... even if there were a community member that came into the school and got to know those individuals, it could be done. I guess I shall like to respond to what you're saying is that we often feel like people come to us with great ideas and we say, wonderful, and we turn around and get busy doing our job. Yeah. And so yeah. we don't have the time to be an advocate. I can speak to that because I, I've had kids in the school, I've, uh, our youngest is a junior and she'll graduate in a little while, but mm -hmm. this is the first year I've really been in that school and not felt weird walking in. And why? is because I'm involved in a project that has to do with the school mm -hmm. and something I'm passionate mm -hmm. about. And so I'm able to walk in there and I, I know I, I, I'm passionate about something I've made I mean, I've had relationships with the teachers anyway because my mm -hmm. children have been there, but it's so different now. Mm -hmm. Is because I have a passion <laughs> and, I, and I'm okay with having a passion and doing something. So sure. I think that, just as an encouragement, I think yeah. that it works. And as long as you're not in there stepping on everybody's toes, I think, you know, if you're working alongside people, you know, people have, have, will get to know that, hey, this is like, this might be a good thing for us. Yeah. You know, this might be this might be good. So anyway, I just know that from experience. Yes. And a very important aspect. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And helping all of us who aren't involved, like because you all are yeah. at the end to understand, you know, where those where those pinch points are, mm -hmm. how we as a community can help alleviate those pinch points and basically help all of these incredible ideas. How can we help them I think it's a question, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so can, could somebody take a little piece of your time and dive into that deeper? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's open. Is there anybody in the room? Like, my room's open. Yeah, she's going to carry that torch out, by the way. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. Hour a week, two hours a week. Yeah. 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 No, I'll take them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can come in and I know. Yeah. I'm all for it. So if we put the word out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
build that bridge. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any ideas about bringing families here to the valley, as far as um, that's a big question, I guess. But you know, well, the schools is a big retention factor for people who have children. Also, you know, how do we attract families? Here, I mean, of course, if we have great opportunities for students, that's one way. But, um, are we putting out, and you know, is there a marketing sort of thing going on with the hive or with the economic development or the chamber? I know there is pieces of it, but how are those? Um, I, I don't think there's any real outreach that's saying, you know, here comes this beautiful, wonderful place. Uh, there is a trend, though, um, and there's some work out of the University of Minnesota uh, that's looking at rural areas and small towns, and, and what they're seeing is it's kind of below the radar because when you look at the, the demographic roll-up on a statewide basis or even a county basis, the small, the small percentages don't look like much. I mean, one family coming into Crawford is a huge leap, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't get recorded at the Colorado level. Um, but uh, the trend that, that this gentleman is seeing all over in small towns is that there are two demographic groups, two, migration in two areas. Um, uh, one is the 30 plus group, 30 to 35 year old sort of. And the other is the 60 plus. Mm -hmm. and, and so many of the 30 pluses are coming on their own. They're not, they don't have families, maybe, maybe they have partners, maybe they don't. Um, but if, they're, if they have a reason to come to a small town, they're coming for quality of life. Mm -hmm. They're not coming for the career ladder. They're coming for quality of life. Um, which is the same reason the 60 year olds are coming, for quality of life. Yeah. They're tired of the city, they're tired of the rat race. And, and if a small town can uh, recruit and retain that 30-year-old block. Guess what? They do find partners. They do have families, and then you've got this this three kids coming into the school system. Um, and and the, they're seeing this in, in small towns and rural areas. And they did they did a little work. Uh, sent me some data that, um, that that does show that uptick here. And, and, and that it is happening. And I think we see that particularly here with Peoria. We're seeing this influx of, of uh, young people. And it would only give them a reason to stay. And so the high kind of gives some of them a reason to stay. They've got a co-working space. They've got people that they can affiliate with and they can work with. And, um, and one of the things that this gentleman, his name is um, Ben Winchester, um, advocates for is to have a retention plan. That, that a town has a retention plan. Yeah and actually actively is working to keep um, the people here and coming here. And that means their kids come to the schools, and that means you know, we, we, we have a beautiful quality of life. We got a great setting. People want to come here. We got to need to give them a reason to stay. And organizations like SEI, well, you're bringing in 70 jobs. Um, you know, it's to create that reason to stay because, uh, because uh, they, we do have those kind of jobs. And um, so I, I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm an optimist, but I, I do believe that that is possible. And if we give, give that reason, we help retain. So nobody wants to work on a retention strategy. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought the retention <laughs> strategy is for us to have industry here. Yeah. We've lost so much of our industry. Yeah. We need replacements. Yeah. Yeah. We need yeah. Jobs. Yeah. So Chelsea's patient had her hand up. Um, I was in hearing everything that Elaine has been talking about and trends and things that are happening around the country, things that are happening around the state, and I just am um, in putting my um, Waldorf hat on. That is a huge trend. It's the fastest growing segment of education in the world, um, and the opportunity to bring that here is another attractor for families, and it is another thing that keeps families here. Um, and I can just say that the families who are involved in that program just in this community, I mean, this building, Studio Asia, Delicious Orchards, they're, I mean, these are big players in our community, and that's what they are asking for, for education for their children. And many of them, if they can't find that education here, again, they will go. So how do we work to provide all of those opportunities for all of these kids, and not just say, well, 
we can't, we're too small. We, you know, this scarcity mentality only serves to bring us down instead of saying, you know, this, the more diverse you are, I mean, in any system you see, diversity is your strength. So the more diverse we are, this is such a diverse community anyway. I mean, who would have thought that this thing could even happen? Like, this is the craziest idea, and everybody, there was naysayers, and no way, no way you can have this co-working, what is that, whatever, you know, and it's super successful, and so I think to embrace change and move forward and be able to think outside the box and get creative and implement all of those in our community, that's what attracts people and that's what makes people stay. I wonder, like, the model with the Montessori School obviously worked pretty well, and now it's been supported and grown within the district and by the district. Is it possible for the Waldorf model to exist similarly to that? Are there public Waldorf schools and how many? And, and or is it possible to meld Waldorf? Because they have, it seems like they need <coughs> their own system. It's sort of a system in itself, is it not? Because it's not, how, how much can it meld with some of the other well, I mean, I think that the, the growth of the public Waldorf charter schools is proof that it can meld. And so, um, like, what's happening throughout the state is that those those charter schools are popping up and they're packed and they're on waiting lists and mm -hmm. people are coming from multiple counties to those schools. And a lot of them are in their startup years and so, you know, they're like anything, like any business or anything that happens, those startup years, you're getting your footing. But the ones that you see that are established, like Mountain Phoenix and Denver, like you see those schools, and they are successful, and they are meeting standards and you know crossing all of those bridges that need to happen. And so, yeah, I mean, can they coexist? Absolutely. Like, there's absolutely nothing to say that that can't happen. And I, I think that that's that's where this district and this community and just where we are, that's what, that's what our community demands and that's what's happened, is that these alternatives have sprouted up and had passionate people behind them and now absolutely they are assets to the district, vision, Montessori, all of that and so yeah, I, would, I would put that out there as the challenge, like who's to say that that isn't a possibility? That five are there years any down the road inside the district, like district Waldorf schools? Not charters, but district Walder schools, like the Montessori school. Is. There is a school. Uh, there's a school in Boulder that is. Um, it's it's a cooperative sort of thing. So um, they're they have like an interesting situation, but they are they're part of the district, uh -huh. and they operate their Walder entity within that framework. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's possible. Okay, so on that note, I think we're going we're gonna to end this just to honor everyone's time, which is a little bit after 8. Um, this is, you know, obviously there's a lot of discussions happening within our community, both at the school district level, with, with, with small groups of people, with people just talking to each other about how important our education system is, how important it is to our economy and the economic development of this, of this community. And so hopefully you, we are leaving here, you know, maybe there's something that you're going to take away like, no, I can work on this particular piece, or I want to find out this, more about this. And you know, there's a lot of ideas here that have come out from this discussion tonight. And it's going to keep going. I know that lots of people in this room, whether you're a superintendent or a teacher or involved with other initiatives, you know, you're passionate about what you're doing. And I just want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing, for teaching our kids, for trying to make this, oh my God, project. <laughs> who make a successful school district. It's everyone. So <coughs> thank you for being part of this conversation. And um, I'm sure there's going to be more to come. So have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.